All right, it's going. Okay, guys, today we are going to do metallic bonding. So get your notes out. And I need to go to slide 25. Okay, how can okay, I get away? F5. F5. To go to. All right, so um, let me start by saying this. You guys have a quiz tomorrow. It's a quiz. It's 18 points. My students always tell me that they think anything less than 20 points is a quiz. It's a very easy quiz. Most of the quiz consists of looking up the electronegativities off the periodic table, subtracting them, and telling me what range it's in. Is it less than 0.3, which makes um, it a nonpolar covalent? Is it between 0.3 and 2.0, which makes it polar covalent? Or is it greater than 2, it makes it ionic? Now, today is the last type of bonding. It's crazy. It has a different um, type of explanation than ionic and covalent. And, um, and so we're going to talk about metallic bonding, and it's pretty, um, it's pretty straightforward. It's actually one of my favorite things to teach. OK, so now there's three types of bonding in chemistry. There's metallic bonding, which is between atoms of metal. There's ionic bonding, and there's covalent bonding. So there's metallic, ionic, and covalent. And um, But we now know that covalent has two subcategories, nonpolar covalent and polar covalent. And so I'm going to talk about metallic bonding. Now, I don't want you to write down the slide. Here's why I have this slide on here. From your life experience, do you know that metals conduct heat and electricity? So if you stick a fork in the outlet, you're going to get a shock. Um, the wiring in your house is, has usually rubber on the outside, which isn't a conductor, and then metal on the inside. Um, the other thing we know about metals is they shine. When, when light hits metal, it bounces back to your eye and reflects, and that's what shininess or luster is. And metals are malleable, which means if you pound on a metal, it dents. It doesn't shatter. The opposite of being malleable is being brittle. So um, metals tend to be malleable. If you pound on them, they dent or they bend. They don't shatter. Nonmetals that are solids tend to be brittle. And the one nonmetal that you guys have a lot of experience with is pure carbon, because that's like a charcoal briquette. And so um, if you pound on one of those black Kingsford charcoal briquettes, it shatters into a bunch of pieces. It's not malleable, it's brittle. The opposite of being malleable is being brittle. Now, I don't care if you write these down. We've talked about these before, but this is why they're my first slide on my PowerPoint is, when I'm done talking about metallic bonding, my model of metallic bonding has to work to explain why do metals conduct electricity, why do metals shine, why are metals malleable, and why are metals ductile. Now, this is actually out of my AP book, and ductility is hammered in your book, but ductility is the ability to pull things into long, thin wires, and metals are very ductile. Um, and how they make wires is they use dyes with like holes in them, and I'm showing my class, but I can't really show this, but they take metal and they extrude it through a die, kind of like my granddaughter plays with Play-Doh. You know how you push the Play-Doh through the circle, and you get this little rope of Play-Doh, and then they take that and they push it through a smaller die, and they push it through a smaller die, and eventually it's like really thin, like spaghetti noodle size. And that's what ductility is. And so when I'm all done explaining metallic bonding, which let me say it again, it's my favorite, one of my favorite things to teach. At the very end, the model has got to explain why metals conduct heat and electricity, why they're shiny, why they're malleable, and why they're ductile. I don't care if you write this down. Now, do not write this whole slide down. I just put it in here to jog my memory. So any successful bonding model for metals must account for the typical physical properties of metals. The simplest picture that explains this is the electron C model. The first thing I want you to write down 
is metallic bondings and electron C model. That's all I want you to write down. Metallic bonding equals electron C model. All right, now I'm going to tell you each, those two words are both very, very important. Everyone have this down? I don't want you to copy down the whole slide. I just want electron C model. Okay, electron. All bonding is described in terms of electrons. Ionic bonding is the transfer of valence electrons. Covalent bonding is the sharing of valence electrons. And, I, and metallic bonding is the electron C model. Do you hear me say electron in all of them? Ionic, and actually there's four types, so let me do all four. Ionic is the transfer of electrons. Covalent, nah, polar covalent is unequal sharing of valence electrons. Nonpolar covalent is equal sharing of valence electrons. And metallic bonding is the electron C model. Does that make sense? All right, now. First word, electron. Electron is huge because all bonding is described in terms of electron. This is the most important thing. Um, what does it mean when you spell C S E A? Because that's the key to this model. Water, ocean, correct? It could be called the electron ocean model or the electron liquid model, but it's called the electron C model. And this model envisions a, re a regular array of metal cations and a sea of valence electrons. These electrons are referred to as delocalized or mobile electrons. So on this slide, um, what do else I'm, okay, copy this down. I'll wait for you to copy this down right there. That's all, um, and I'm going to tell you what that means in a minute. It's going to take you a while to copy that down. So. Okay, now I'm going to draw a picture in a minute, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to picture a lake, a lake or a river or an ocean or some body of water. Okay, let's take the properties of metals. Um, why don't you want to drop a toaster or a blow dryer in the bathtub when you're in there? You electrocute yourself. Why? Because water conducts heat and electricity, correct? And so what happens is, if you think of the electron C model in a minute when I draw the picture, is little tiny islands surrounded by a sea of electrons. And just like the oceans move with tides and waves, the electron C moves, because that's what delocalized means. It moves away from its original location. Mobile, did you guys write something about mobile electrons? The electrons start to move just like the water moves. And so in terms of properties of metals, you don't want to drop a toaster or a blow dryer in the bathtub that you're sitting in because you'll get electrocuted because water, or C, S-E-A, conducts heat and electricity. Why is it that metals don't break? Well, if I take my fist and put it in the ocean, the ocean doesn't shatter. It's in the liquid state. Doesn't it just reform around my hand? And so this electron C model um, accounts for the fact that... Um, that metals don't shatter. They just, like water, it's fluid. The electron C is fluid and it reforms. It doesn't shatter. Um, why are metals shiny? Well, 
have you ever been out on the lake or the ocean when the sun's out? It hits the liquid and it bounces back and hits your eye. And that's the same thing. When a photon of light hits a nice, you know, 14 karat gold necklet or, or something, it'll hit it. It won't be absorbed. It will bounce back because the C acts very much like the real C does. Um, why is it that um, metals are, are ductile? Because you have this fluid, this liquid fluid. You know, water, you can put it through really tiny straws. It just moves. You can draw it into long, thin what Metals can be drawn into long, thin wires because it's fluid. It moves like the ocean does, and you can push it into very thin areas. You know, because how they make wire is they push the metal through you know, these dyes that get progressively smaller. And so I'm going to draw you a picture in a minute. But before, um, I don't want you to write this down, but I just want to talk about it. The sea of delocalized electrons holding the metallic cations together is what is a metallic bond. It's this connection between the positive cations and the negative electrons that are in the sea flowing between the little islands. I'll draw you a picture in a minute. But before I do that, you are not responsible for this. Um, but I want to talk about this slide, and then I'm going to draw a picture. There is a relationship between the number of delocalized electrons per atom and the strength of a metal. Do not write this down. Group 1 or Group 1A, like we called them last chapter, they have one valence electron. They contribute one electron to the electron C per atom. And as a result, um, the alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium, they're very soft. They're so soft that you can cut them with like one of my metal scoops when I do my um, sodium demo, I actually cut them with that. Group 2 have two valence electrons, so they contribute two electrons to the C. They're still really soft, but they're a little bit harder than group one. Now, when I was writing this lecture a number of years ago, three to five have three to five. What that means is group three contributes three, group four contributes four, group five contributes five. Then you get to group six and ten, which are the absolute hardest metals on the periodic table. This is iron and the things that we build skyscrapers out of. Group 6 through 10 all contribute 6 electrons per atom to the C. Um, they are the absolute hardest metals on the chart. And so it's the old naming system. So group 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, notice iron is right in the middle there. And so um, these are the absolute... Um, those are the absolute hardest. And then when you get to groups 11 and 12, and that's um, then it backs off a little bit, and it, there's no pattern, but there's less than six. Now, I am going to walk over to my computer and get out of here, and then I want to draw you actually what's going on. So escape, and now i got to flip over to this guy. Okay, so here's what happens. You have a bunch of iron, which is in group... Eight, you have a bunch of group. You have a bunch of iron atoms crowding together, and here's what actually happens: the iron atom turns into an iron cation with a plus six charge. Where do those six electrons go? They go into the what's the name of math? The model, the electron C. So each now think about this. Every atom contributes six electrons to the C. So for every one car, uh, iron atom, it's contributing six electrons. One mole of iron atoms contributes six moles of electrons. What happens from last chapter, do you understand that iron has 26 protons and 26 electrons, but when it gives away six electrons to the C, it turns into 26 protons and 20 electrons. And so these cations end up being incredibly tiny. And I think of these as the uh, Hawaiian islands. <laughs> okay, so these are like little islands in Hawaii. By the way, this is three-dimensional. It's top, bottom, left, right, front, back. I'll just do four. Okay, so these are tiny. Then what ends up flowing between these cations is a whole bunch of what? 
What's in the sea? What's in the sea here? Come on, guys. It's called the electron C model. What's in the C? This is not good. What's in the C? Electrons. That's why it's called the electron C model, correct? Now, why is this bond so incredibly strong? Well, when I was taping my lectures, when I was in Jamaica, we talked about the force of attraction depends on three things. It actually depends on the magnitude of the positive charge, the magnitude of the negative charge, and the distance between the charges. And here's why metallic bonds are so strong. Plus six, minus six. These plus six and minus six are really big Q's. You know, if these were ones, one times one, now they're six. Six times six is 36. And then because these are so tiny and because the electrons surround them, the distance between them is tiny. When you take a tiny number and you square it, it's even tinier. But when you take a big number and divide by a small number, the answer gets really big, correct? Take a big number like 100 and divide by a hundredth, and now you have a hundred times a hundred, which would be what, 10,000? And so um, this is why this bond is so incredibly strong because um, of the electron C model. So let me just, so going back to my PowerPoint, which I'm not gonna show the right way. See this picture? Now going back to this big giant slide, um, I had you copy this down. This model envisions a regular array of metal cations. Put this down. I hate that one that happens. Metal cations. That was where those little Fe plus six islands. Um, in a sea of valence electrons, those electrons move like the sea moves. They they go into this. Now, if you look at this picture. Again, let me just summarize and think water. Why is it that metals conduct electron electricity? Well, all electricity is the flow of electrons. So if you apply an electric current to this, like by putting it into an outlet or something, all the electrons do is they come out of the outlet and they enter the sea and they flow with the rest of the electrons and they come out the other end. Well, isn't that what electron electro um, electric conductivity is? Is being able to get this flow of electrons. Um, and again, they're malleable because when you hit them, you just the C just reforms. It's movable, mobile electrons. Um, if your light hits it, it bounces off, just like light bounces off the ocean. And um, they're, they're ductile, meaning you can push them into really thin wires because they're very mobile. And these are very tiny. So having said all that, here's what I could ask you tomorrow on the test because this is very theoretical. So which type of bonding is characterized by the transfer of valence electrons? You would all say ionic. What type of bonding is characterized by the sharing of valence electrons? You'd say covalent. What type of bonding is explained using the electron C model? Metallic. And so what happens is it's it's the metals give up electrons to the C and opposites attract. The C is negatively charged. The islands are positively charged. And the charges are huge. And the distance between the C and the islands is small, which makes us the strongest of all the bonds. Now, last thing. I might walk over here. I just want to talk about alloys, because what did you guys do yesterday? You made an alloy called brass, correct? And so I just want to tell you about a couple more alloys. So where is my alloy slide? Okay. Okay, last slide in my PowerPoint um, from yesterday. Oops, that was not good. Um, from yesterday, a metallic material that contains two or more elements, usually metals, is called an alloy. I would just like to see this. The most important and the most common alloy is steel. Have you heard of steel? What they found was, and they think, because we've known about steel for a long time, but they think what happened is probably a long time ago, prehistoric time, some kind of blacksmith was melting iron to make a sword or something, and he dropped it, and it dropped, and do you know, like, the ashes from burning wood is pure carbon, 
And so what happens is, for however they figured it out, they figured out that if you put a little bit of carbon into iron and mix them, you get something that looks like iron but is even stronger. And the reason why it's even stronger is carbon is a nonmetal. It has four valence electrons. It contributes them all to the C. And um, it makes the it makes steel even stronger than iron alone. Um, stainless steel. Notice up here, steel is iron and carbon. Stainless steel is important because most people eat off stainless steel and we don't want the silverware to rust in the dishwasher <laughs> when you're washing it. And so for whatever reason, if you add a little bit of chromium and nickel to steel, it won't rust. And so that's what stainless steel is. Brass. You made brass yesterday. You took a pre-1982 penny. You boiled it in zinc and lye solution. And the zinc um, coated the top of the penny. And then you passed it through the flame. And really what that did is made the copper and zinc atoms vibrate and mix. And it changed to that pretty gold color. So what happens is Copper is reddish brown, zinc is silver, and when you mix them, you get that brass color, that kind of golden color. And so it's still a metal, but it actually combines the properties of both. Bronze, like the bronze metal in the Olympics or the Bronze Age, is when you mix copper and tin. And sterling silver, real silver tarnishes, it's black. You have, you know, it gets this black coating that you have to clean, clean off. If you put a little bit of copper in it, it doesn't tarnish as much. It still tarnishes, but it's much slower than uh, pure silver, and that's called sterling silver. And then my favorite that isn't on here is 14 karat gold is an alloy. It's 14 24 gold and 10 24 silver. When you mix silver and gold in that ratio, it's much harder than gold alone, and it's much shinier. Pure 24 karat gold is not very shiny, and it's really soft, like you can dent it if you wear it. And so that's it. So tomorrow, I think there's only two questions on metallic bonding. So just know that it's ex there's one multiple choice question about properties of metals. They're hard. They're shiny. They conduct heat and electricity. They're malleable. They're ductile. And there's one about the electron C model. All right. We are done. So you guys. You guys